Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 9.0, where we're going to continue discussing plant breeding by talking about genetically modified organisms. We'll talk about the steps in producing a genetically modified plant, the development and the testing, and then the bureaucracy, the application for approval and the waiting, and we'll talk about the public suspicion as well. So the steps in producing a plant by genetic modification by controlled in vitro engineering are very different from those from a conventional plant breeding program. Again, you start by deciding, well, what plant, what species do you want to change and what phenotype do you want to change? But then the next step is to decide, well, what DNA am I going to insert in this plant to bring about my phenotypic change? Rarely is it a deletion. Usually there's something you want to insert. This may be a DNA that will add a new function, or you may use what's antisense RNA, which you might remember from back in, I think, Module 3, um, to turn off an unwanted function. Sometimes you will find the gene in another species, or very often now, you'll have it synthesized. Um, last year, the cheapest price was 28 cents a base pair. This year, we're down to 23 cents a base pair. This means that even a moderately large gene, one that might contain um, a thousand amino acids, will not cost more than a thousand dollars. That's cheap. The next step is you have to choose your recipient strain. In this case, you're picking one strain the genetic background matters. You want that strain to have particular genetic properties, but you don't have to think at all about genetic variation or about heritability because you're going to put in the gene that you want. Usually the DNA is inserted into the target genome, the genomes of single cells of the plant that you want grown in plant tissue culture. And usually the gene integrates at random locations in the genome, which is kind of a nuisance. It's hard to control where the DNA will integrate because it's usually integrated by DNA repair processes that are not tightly controlled. So you have to check, did the DNA that you put into the cell actually integrate into the genome? And is that DNA expressed? Even if the DNA that you put in has its own promoter, it might be in a part of the genome that's normally quiescent and not, even with promoters, not well expressed. So you have to check that your gene is expressed. And then you grow genes, grow plants from your now transgenic cells and start screening for the desired phenotype. Over here we have an example of cultures being grown of transgenic petunias. In which the gene for the purple pigment is being selectively shut off in some parts of the flower by, trans by um, antisense RNA. Then you have to test, once your plants are growing, is the gene being expressed when you want it to be expressed and in the tissues that you want. And all of this testing has to be carried out in special escape-proof fields because people are worried that genetically modified plants could be dangerous. Now I'm going to tell you the story of a particular genetically modified plant, and that's golden rice. Golden rice was developed to address a very important health problem that's particularly prevalent in Southeast Asia, and that's that many people go blind or even die from lack of vitamin A. It's estimated that as um, up to, no, it's estimated that 500,000 people a year, mainly small children and pregnant women, go blind because of a lack of vitamin A. So the solution was to breed a strain of rice whose endosperm, that's the part of the rice we eat, the kernel, supplies the
the daily requirements of vitamin A's precursor beta carotene. Our bodies have no trouble making vitamin A out of beta carotene. There's lots of beta carotene in green and yellow vegetables, but for many poor people in these countries, their diet is deficient in, in the vegetables that would naturally supply the vitamin. And governments have been reduced to giving people injections of vitamins, but it would be much more efficient if people could simply grow strains of rice that provided the vitamin A that they need. Um, this was not completely straightforward because conventional breeding programs wouldn't work. Rice doesn't have a pathway to produce beta carotene in its endosperm, only in its leaves. And nobody eats the leaves of rice, it's basically grass. Um, and there was no way to cause the genes to be expressed in the plant. And so instead, they engineered a variety of rice that contained the missing genes. These are the steps. Here's the metabolic pathway. First step catalyzed by a gene called phyto, protein called phytoene synthase, which was brought in first from daffodils and then from maize, according to Americans. Um, and the second two steps catalyzed by a different gene and this gene was most efficiently brought in from a soil bacterium strain called Urinia. So they created the strain of rice that produced vitamin A. And because beta carotene is yellow, they called the rice golden rice. So they tested it carefully in escape proof fields for escape proof patties, I guess, for the amount of beta carotene for the availability of the beta carotene, whether people could actually take it up in their diet, and whether it was biologically efficient, effective, whether it actually prevented um, vitamin A deficiency. And they tested to make sure that these artificial, unnatural genes did not cause immune reactions, allergic reactions, in people who ate it. So everything they tested said, this is healthy, this is wholesome, this is an excellent source of vitamin A. So then they applied for approval. That was 13 years ago, and they're still waiting for approval. Here's conventional rice, pretty boring. And here's golden rice, which is beautiful and wholesome. So what's stymieing the success of crops like this is that people are frightened of the genetic technology. They distrust the big agribusiness companies that um, are producing most of these strains. That's not true of golden rice, which was produced by nonprofit companies um, and designed to be a crop that people could grow repeatedly generation after generation. It's not a hybrid plant. Um, but people distrust corporations, and then they came to discuss their governments, and they came to discuss even the scientists. And so many of these crops are simply, people are very afraid. And I'm hoping that when people understand genetics better, they'll be better able to say, okay, let's really evaluate the risk fairly. So what we've done, we considered genetic engineering modifications in contrast to the procedures required for conventional breeding. In terms of the amount of time and work and expense, the engineered genetic modifications are far easier. In terms of the amount of untested variation in the plants, they're actually also much better because we start with a single plant with known properties and change one gene. Whereas in conventional breeding, there's this enormous background of mutations, especially if genes are brought in from wild strains or if the plant has been irradiated to create mutations. So almost all conventionally bred plants have treatment with mutagenic chemicals or radiation in their background breeding. But the level of public concern is far higher for genetically engineered plants than for conventionally bred plants. Coming up next is module 10, where we're going to talk about changes in chromosome structure and number, of which my favorite example is the breeding of strawberries from the tiny little wild wood strawberries to 
the monstrous strawberries that we see in the supermarket today. And that's due to changes primarily in chromosome number. Big chromosome, big strawberries have more copies of their chromosomes than little strawberries. I hope to see you there.